can you guys join me in welcoming our director, pastor of disciple making, Christopher Ledesma. I know I want you to stand to your feet this morning. You can keep clapping. You can stand and clap at the same time. The Bible says, give honor where honor is due. And if he will allow me, I just want us to stretch our hands towards him and pray. And I'm not, I'm not just praying for what God's going to do in this session. I'm confident that what we're about to experience, not only today, but the rest of this year, is going to be so transformative and powerful. What I want you to pray is very simply that he would feel that he would feel the fruit, that he would feel the impact of his yes, not only today but the rest of this year. For a decade, he has been doing what he's about to do in this room and for our local church. He's been doing it in his own living room. He's been doing it in his own living room. So we're eating the fruit of not something that he just came up with a year ago or even a couple years ago, but we're, we're eating the fruit of his life, what he and his wife and his family have been pouring in to brothers and sisters in Christ for a decade. And I, I just want today and the rest of this year to be a time that he feasts on the fruit of his yes. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you right now for our brother. We thank you for the honor and the privilege to stand here with him and to celebrate this moment. Lord, I know the prayers that have been prayed in the secret place. Lord, I know the cries that have been shed, the tears, Lord God, that have rolled down his cheeks as he carries a burden to see your sons and daughters, your bride, your church equipped to be disciples and make disciples. I pray that today, that as he stands here and as he delivers what you have given him, the download that you have given him, what he has stewarded in the secret place, in his home, in his living room, I pray that today that he would see and experience on the inside your pleasure and your delight, that he would taste of the fruit of his obedience today. Lord, I know that other churches are watching. I know that other pastors have been texting me all week Gerald, how are you guys going to pull this off? How are you going to do this? A local church taking out the chairs, putting, putting round tables and sitting people next to one another for disciple-making training. How are you going to do this? But, Lord, I pray that just as we have been preparing and as we stand here right now, that you would allow Christopher to experience your peace. And as he shares today, that he would know the same thing that we're asking every person to measure their success by is the same thing that he's allowed to measure his success by, obedience, obedience. Holy Spirit, we need you. Would you come upon him today? Would you anoint him? And again, would you allow him to taste of the fruit of his yes? Bless him, bless him, bless him in, mighty, in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Listen, before Gerald goes up, um, look around. What we are doing, in some sense, is a big risk. But in other senses, it's not because there's never a risk in hearing God and obeying his voice. But it's Gerald who had the vision for this. I didn't have the vision for this. When he said we should do this, I said, I don't like that idea. This, that's not a good idea. But being uh, the visionary he is, being the apostle he is, he knew uh, what God would do. And he trusted all of you that your yes would have a greater impact than any of us would imagine. So can we just thank the Lord one more time for our pastor? Please feel free to take a seat. If you have looked around, it is not hard to tell that something like this um, takes a whole lot of people to pull off. Am I right? I try to say this frequently because it's true. Usually the people with the microphone get the most amount of credit, but they're not always the ones who deserve it. And so I just want to be very, very clear that without a very uh, concerted, um, hardworking team effort, none of this happens. There's a care team. There's a setup team. There's a directional team. 
Uh, there's a, a make it happen team. Um, there are lots of people putting their hands to the plow to make sure that you have chairs and you have a tablecloth and somewhere to sit and binders and pens and notebooks and music and media and all of the rest. And so um, when you see me, know that I'm just representative of lots and lots of other people who are doing the work. And as you see them, um, if you even think they did something, uh, could you just say thank you? Could you just say thank you? I have a lot of things over here, including one of these beautiful binders. So I know that when some of you walked in uh, this morning who are aware of what we're doing, you were like, I have been waiting for something like this my entire Christian walk. Because I've heard some of you say that, and it has been so encouraging. And some of you, when you walked in, you were like, this is not what I signed up for when I came to Garden City. Some of you were like, oh, I don't know about this. And some of you were probably like, what is going on? Right. Am I right? And all of those are okay. All of those are okay. So what I want to do is I just want to jump straight in um, by taking you through the welcome letter in your binder. And then we'll break it down. So let's open up the binders. And I'm just going to read. It says, welcome. We are honored and privileged to partner with you as we seek to answer the call of the great commandment and the great commission. We believe that as a follower of Jesus, you are God's special workmanship who was created to do good works for his glory. As such, we have come together as a leadership team and dedicated the third and fourth Sunday of the month to teach you practical tools that will empower you to do so. Along with the tools that will help you develop, excuse me, along with tools that will help you develop daily expressions of the great commandment and great commission, we will teach you the principles and six pillars of the mountain called disciple making model. Pillar one, know Christ. Pillar two, identity in Christ. Pillar three, obey Christ. Pillar four, be with Christ. Pillar five, go for Christ. Pillar six, authority in Christ. This is not another class or church program that is just for your personal growth. This model is designed for you to reproduce. Uh, this model is designed for you to reproduce outside of these gatherings. Although we are doing this in a large group setting, it is best done one-on-one -on -one or with a small group of people, so we've tried to put together the most personal experience possible. Make sure to bring your binder or notebook and your Bible every week to get the most out of it. And I'll just add a paper Bible, paper Bible if you have one, and it won't take you long to realize why. As we walk through this together, we invite you to regularly do three things. One, pray for courage and boldness. Two, renounce fear and doubt. And three, remember that Christ loves you and is with you. You were made to love and be loved by God to love and be loved by people, and to make and multiply disciples. It is our joy to equip you to live that out. So I know that many of you are familiar with that opening phrase, 
uh, those opening phrases, the great commandment and the great commission. Uh, but not everyone is. For example, one study shows that over half the people who go to church um, did not recognize the phrase, the Great Commission. Half the people, when asked, are you familiar with the phrase Great Commission, they said no. And only 17% of those people asked could tell you what passage that phrase even refers to. So I want to do my best during this entire journey not to take anything for granted. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, um, I imagine that you're probably not familiar with those two terms, and that's okay. Um, what I want to say clearly to you is that you are welcome here. What's most important for you to know is that God has a plan for your life that's greater than even you could imagine. And when you do decide to follow Jesus, gatherings like these are signs that you will not have to try to figure out things by yourself. But rather, there is a whole group of people who will be deeply invested in helping you grow closer to God and walk out his plan and purpose for your life. So I invite you just to sit and to learn um, and to observe and just to know that you are loved and welcomed. So going back to the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, those two passages that are right there at the top of the intro letter, um, we're going to unpack them both in a great deal. Uh, but very simply, uh, the Great Commandment is what Jesus says is the most important command for us to obey. And there's two parts, to love God and to love people. The Great Commission is his call for us to go out and share the gospel and to help people become faithful, obedient followers of Jesus and to teach them to obey everything that he commanded, including the call for them to go out and share the gospel and teach others to be faithful, obedient followers of Jesus. And on and on until everyone in our neighborhood to the nations praise the beauty and worth of Jesus and experience the love that he died and rose for them to have. So what I want to do is I want to start off by us actually just reading those two passages together because everything we do is going to flow out of that. You don't have to stand. Um, the media team is going to put them on the screens, and what I want to do is I want to read them together out loud. While they do, I'm going to adjust this mic stand. They're fast. All right. All right, ready? Let's read. Jesus answered. Mark 12, 29 through 31. The Great Commission. Ready? Read. Amen. Amen. So over the next year, we're going to talk a lot about making disciples and all the things that go along with that. Um, so I, right off the bat, I just want to make it clear. Your salvation and God's love for you is not dependent on what you do. Listen to what Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says. It 
It says, for grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of work so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not only is your salvation um, and God's love not dependent on what you do, but your place in the family of God and in this community is not dependent on what you do. Your identity in Christ is not dependent on what you do. You are God's workmanship, period. I think it's important to say that to make it clear because knowing and believing that will allow you to uh, go out and make disciples and do things from a pure heart and genuine freedom without feeling any pressure to perform. But with that said, I want to turn your attention to verse 10. You were created for good works. It is the very, it is at the core of why God has given you life. And so even though our salvation and our identity is not dependent on what we will do, like we've talked about many times before, our roles and rewards in eternity certainly is. See, it's easy to say, well, it's not based on what I do and it's not based on work, so it doesn't matter. Oh, brothers and sisters, let me tell you. It matters a great deal what you do. Not just now, but forever. What God is able to entrust you with in the new heavens and the new earth will largely be based on how you respond to the great commandment and to the great commission. Let me just give you one verse. It will not be on the screen. It's Revelation twenty two twelve. It says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works. According to his works. So if your role and rewards in the new heaven and new earth are based on how you respond to the great commandment and the great commission, um, it is our responsibility as leaders to equip you to effectively, uh, to respond well and respond effectively. It's what Ephesians 4.11 says, right? That God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So if we're going to equip you to respond effectively and to respond well, and if we're going to equip you to partner with Christ and to build and expand the kingdom of God, if we're going to equip you to fulfill the prophetic word, to take new territory, and I would even add to take back territory and ground that has been lost in your personal lives and in your spheres of influence. How many of you know there's a lot of lost ground that we need to take back? We need to put some tools in your hands. See, what I have found over the years is that people don't lack information, especially in the West, right? You can get any book you want, listen to any book you want online. You can watch a sermon from just about any preacher. It's not information we lack. What people lack often is the understanding of how to un apply the information that they know and the tools to help them do that. And that's what all of this is about, is saying we no longer want to fill you with information. We want to put tools in your hands. Let me read a passage that shows the importance um, of this. I learned a lot from this little passage that's easy to pass over. It's from Nehemiah 4. Nehemiah was just an ordinary guy, but he led a team of people to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem after the cities had been destroyed. And during the process, a lot of people were rising up against them to stop the work. But God continued to defend them. 
And so I'm going to pick up in verse 15. Oh, yep, there it is on your screen. Verse 15, here's what it says. It says, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall, and those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore a sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. I've learned from Nehemiah that in order to build, especially in the midst of opposition, it requires putting weapons and tools into people's hands. And just like those who built along Nehemiah, alongside Nehemiah, I am confident, like Gerald said, that if you take a hold of these tools, you will experience victory, and you will see fruit. So the tools we're going to teach you come from the mountain called disciple-making model, like it says in your letter. And this is based on Mark 3, 13 through 15. And when it comes to disciple-making, there are several passages that are helpful. But Mark 3, 13 through 15 is probably the most clear and concise outline of how Jesus called and equipped his disciples. It says, he went up on a mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, that they might be with him, he might send them out to preach, and they might have authority to cast out demons. So when we look at this passage, we have to keep in mind a few things. In the Old Testament, very significant things took place on a mountain. The ark that saved God's people, that landed on a mountain. Abraham was called to sacrifice mountain, Isaac up on a mountain. The Ten Commandments were given to Moses on the mountain of God. Jerusalem and the temple were established on a mountain. And when God answered Elijah with fire, where did he do it? On a mountain. So Jesus parallels this same thing in his ministry, right? He overcame, Jesus, he overcame Satan and his temptations on a mountain. He gave his foundational and final messages on a mountain. He was transfigured on a mountain. He ascended from a mountain, and when he sets up his eternal kingdom, he will rule and reign, guess from where? On a mountain. So Mark, he takes the biblical significance of mountains to open up this passage and capture our attention. He tells us that Jesus goes up on a mountain as if to say, pay close attention because something major is about to happen. That's where the name of the model comes from. Uh, it comes from the opening phrase that he went up on a mountain, mountain call. It's designed to reflect that the call that Jesus gave on that mountain that's outlined in the next two verses, that we are still called to respond to and have the opportunity to respond to today is our mountaintop moment. It's the mountaintop moment the mountaintop call for the church. So let's unpack this verse. So Jesus first calls the disciples to himself. In other words, his greatest priority was that they would know him. This is where we get pillar one, know Christ. And then it says, uh, Mark says that he called to him those whom he desired. Now, that phrase isn't necessarily, it's not necessary. It seems like a little throwaway phrase. 
unless it was something that was clearly communicated to the disciples, that they were loved and desired by God, and that's how Jesus wanted them to see themselves. That's the new identity that he wanted to impart to them. So that's where we get pillar two, identity in Christ. Third, it says that they came to him. That seems like a redundancy. Of course they came to him. But what I think Mark is doing there is that he's delineating those who obediently responded and those who did not. Because not everybody who Jesus called came. And so that's where we get pillar three, obey Christ. Fourth, he taught them to be with him. Pillar four, be with Christ. Then he sent them out to go and preach the gospel and make disciples. Pillar five, go for Christ. And then he gave them authority to do so. Pillar six, authority in Christ. So these six pillars, along with some other foundational tools, make up what's called the mountain called disciple making model, which is what we're going to use as we go through these pillars and these tools. So I want you to notice that this is not called a discipleship model. So in one sense, it doesn't really matter what you call it, right? But in another sense, it's designed to communicate something. See, traditional discipleship models um, and just discipleship in general is designed for an individual's personal growth and knowledge of the Bible. Um, I don't want to call anything out because I don't want to seek to demean um, anything that you've ever been a part of. But just think about it. If you've been a follower of Christ for a while, typically they're trying to help you grow, help you know and learn of the Bible, um, and just uh, and be a, a better follower of Jesus. And all of that is really, really good. But what's often lacking is the emphasis on equipping you to be the one that goes out and makes and multiplies disciples. It's like if you learn that, then what you have to do or what you inevitably end up doing is you tell people, hey, come with me to this thing. Or, oh, you've got to read that book. Or let me um, show you this packet. This is totally different. That's why we say in the letter that this is not another class or this is not another church program. It's designed for you to reproduce outside of these gatherings. So as we discuss the tools and the pillars, I'm going to present them to you as I would um, just if I was sitting down with you one on one. When I do this, I typically do it with an individual or a very, very small group. Um, two to three, usually four at the most. It can work in larger settings, but it's not necessarily designed to. Um, but because of the larger group format, there's a, a lot of relational elements that I won't be able to reproduce, and that's why you're at tables. Because what we want to do is give you the most interactive uh, experience possible, and disciple-making is all about relationships. It's all about getting to know people. It's all about learning where they are. It's all about learning um, why God has them where they are and, and what God has put on their heart and, and knowing them so that you're not just trying to run them through some lesson, uh, but you're, you're speaking to the need of their life in the moment. So I have a lot more to say about what we're going to do um, along the way, uh, but I'm going to save a lot of that for next week. Um, but as we go through the pillars, um, we're actually going to start Pillar 1 in February because uh, before I take anyone through any of the pillars, I teach them a few foundational tools. And these tools help you do everything else out of an overflow uh, from time with God and walking alongside others. So there are some of your table hosts that have already, actually all of your table hosts have already seen at least a couple of these tools. 
And so what I want to do is I'm going to bring some of them up now and just ask them to share with you just a little bit of the fruit that they've experienced along the way. So Pam, Alexa, and Sarah, if you're in the building, um, if you guys, ladies, uh, could come up and uh, just share a little bit with the people. Thank you. Um, my name is Pam, and uh, I am so excited about what we are doing. Um, the Lord knew that I needed a lot of time with him, and so I've been walking with him for almost 50 years, and I have never experienced anything like this. Um, I've been all over the world um, teaching people about Jesus and uh wow, we can do it right here, and I'm so excited. Um, so one of the tools that um, Christopher introduced to me for the first time is uh, an intentional tool to write down the saved and the unsaved people that I know uh, to make a monthly calendar, put them on that calendar, and share with them that I'm praying for them. So the fruit of that has been really fun, some discouraging, uh, but I'm going to persevere because some of the unsaved people didn't respond, but I prayed for them anyway, and I will pray for them again next month. Um, some of the people who are unsaved did respond, and they said, thank you. Nobody's ever done that for me before. This is how you can pray for me. Whew. That's awesome. Um, and then the ones that are saved were like, are you kidding me? Nobody's ever asked me on a daily basis, you know, how they can pray for me. So thank you. So that's one of the tools we're going to learn. And it is fantastic. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. So I'm Alexa. Um, I'm just going to give a short testimony about the uninterrupted. There's a tool that we're going to be learning called UTC um, Schedule, which is Uninterrupted Time with Christ. And um, before I share, I just want to say I'm not up here because I have implemented mine perfectly. I've actually failed more than I have succeeded. So that's my disclaimer. But um, so the point of the tool is to set aside and Christopher will go over it, but about an hour a day just with uninterrupted time with the Lord. And, um, you know, my time with the Lord has looked very different in different seasons. And I think there's just so much grace for moms specifically to meet with the Lord in the midst of life and the craziness and um, the neediness <laughs> of little humans. Um, but I did feel the Lord just challenge me to try um, to get uninterrupted time with him. Um, and like I said, I've failed more than I've succeeded because I feel like my kids' schedules keep getting earlier and earlier. But um, I did just want to share when I have been able to get that time, just the blessing that I've received from it. Like, yes, there's grace to seek him in the midst of life, but also when we carve out that time, I just feel there's so much grace, there's so much like, we don't come to that time and not receive just so much strengthening and edification. And I can tell you my days when I get that time all by myself <laughs> with the Lord at my couch or at the table, um, those days are completely different than when I don't get that time. So I'm still striving towards that. Um, I, you know, like Christopher said, it's not performance-based, so I don't beat myself up when I don't get that time in before the kids are up or whatnot. Um, and even just a side note to moms, like when you hear about, you know, this one more thing, really anybody, but I know moms, we, we self-impose a lot of expectations to be a good mom, good wife, good Christ follower, good employee, whatnot. But just keep in mind, like this is an invitation of, from the Lord filled with grace to seek him and develop this consistency. Um, but he's not, you know, he's not harsh or disappointed with us when life happens and we're not able. Um, so there is that. But I just wanted to share that. Hopefully it encourages someone. Yeah, I want to echo exactly what Alexa just said, that there is 
with these tools, so much opportunity for failure. Um, <laughs> and uh, as a good disciple, we take that failure, we learn from it. Um, my testimony actually comes from the prayer calendar, which I have failed at many, many times. Um, I've been blessed enough to be able to walk with Christopher for about uh, 15 months in this process and learning these tools. Um, and I've, I've gone through multiple prayer calendars, have cleared off people, have added more people, just as Holy Spirit says, hey, add this person or remove this person for now. I may have you add this person later on. Um, so my testimony that I have today is I had somebody last year that I put on my list, and they've been on my list for a year. Um, and in one list, I had someone else that has been on my list, and the Lord said, remove them. I'm like, but God, they're on the unsaved list. That's the one I really need to be going after, right? Um, and actually, just last weekend, or just this weekend, I had the person, one person who had been on one list for a year, and God didn't have them be removed from it yet, um, they reached out to me and they said, hey, do you have time for a call? Can you, can you please pray with me? Um, so I, I called them. Um, we went through some inner healing. We went through uh, some great prayer. Holy Spirit showed up. Really did a lot of movement in this person's life. But the testimony is the person that the Holy Spirit had me remove is exactly who was put in the life of the person that is still on my list. And that person is now praying for this person that had me removed. <laughs> so, yeah, as we learn these tools, um, expect change, expect failure, and expect growth. As long as you're obedient to it. <laughs> Amen. Can we celebrate all those testimonies one more time, please? And also, can we do one more thing? Can we um, stop using the word failure? Um, last time I read, the word was follow. And Jesus will take you up some hills, he'll take you into some valleys, um, he'll take you through some difficult journeys. And the only time that you fail is when you stop following. When Peter denied Jesus, did he call him a failure? No. He said, feed my sheep. He said, hey, Peter, just get back up and do it again. When Thomas um, said, I won't believe unless. Jesus didn't say, oh, Thomas, you failed again, bro. He said, hey, touch my hands, touch my side. Like, what do you need me to do to help you? And what, what I, I want to communicate as clear as I can is that there is the only failure in this is just to give up, is just to stop trying. It's just to throw your hands in the air and say, I'm no longer going to. Because nothing that you will learn, um, or maybe let me say it this way instead. Everything that you will learn is simply a tool to do what Jesus has already asked you to do. There's nothing that we're going to put on your plate that's going to be another thing to do. It's going to be another way to do what Jesus has already asked. And that's a big difference. There's nothing that's going to be added to your plate that's not already there. We might highlight that it's there. We might help identify, hey, that this has been sitting on your plate for a while and lacking. Um, so let's eat the scroll. And here's a knife and a fork and a napkin and a glass of water to help it go down. So... Uh, when you give your testimonies, when you examine how you've been doing, um, please uh, do not use the word failure. Failure brings guilt. Failure brings shame. Failure brings burden. 
And none of those are helpful for following Jesus. None of those are helpful for following Jesus. And so if you miss a day, just pick it back up. I cannot tell you how many days I've missed or how many times I haven't done something or how many times I've had to revamp something or redo something over and over and over and over again. Um, I'm just like you. And we're all just doing our best to follow Jesus. All right. So let's get straight into the tool. So the first tool that I'm going to teach you today is going to help you have a daily expression. Remember that phrase, daily expression of the great commandment, especially the aspect of loving him with all of your mind. So it's called the UTC schedule, and it looks like this. Now, you might be asking, uh, why didn't you just put a cool graphic on the screen? I was wondering that. Um, and here's why. Because this whole model is rooted <clears throat> in four principles. Biblical, reproducible, practical, and simple. Biblical, reproducible, practical, and simple. If you want to see movement, if you want to see not just someone come to Christ, but if you want to see disciples who make disciples who make disciples, um, those are the four uh, elements that is going to help accelerate what you're doing. Some of the greatest joys that I have in my life is when I see people who uh, I've had the pleasure to baptize or walk alongside others now baptizing others, and then those that they've baptized, baptizing others. Paul told Timothy, take what I give you and entrust it to faithful people who can entrust it to other faithful people. In other words, from Paul to Timothy, from Timothy to someone, and from that person to another person, four generations deep is what Paul had in mind. And so I'm going to walk you through this and tell you how to draw it out. So I want you to start off by writing a UTC schedule at the top of your page. Now, UTC stands for undistracted time with Christ. Undistracted time with Christ. Now, let me just first say this. I know that there are certain seasons uh, of your life where it's hard to even get five minutes of alone time. Uh, my wife and I have four children. We have two under two. We have one that is going through all of the 18-month regressions. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Um, if you're a grandparent, you definitely know what I'm talking about. Um, and so we often live in that world where um, it is nearly impossible to get five minutes of alone time or quiet time. Uh, we change a lot of poopy diapers at our house. Um, and in those seasons and in those situations, God is gracious, God is merciful, and there is no banner of failure. Um, but with that said, Conversely, both in those seasons and even when you're not in that season of life, it is very easy to have your prayer time, to get in the habit of having your prayer time overlap with things like household chores and driving um, and, uh, and kind of just chalking it up to practicing the presence of God. And it's good. We should. Um, we should pray when we drive, we should pray when we wash dishes, but when it comes to love, one of the greatest ways that you can show someone that you love them is by giving them your undistracted attention. 
So this tool is rooted in Mark 12, 30, which is the aspect of the great commandment um, to love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. All of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Specifically and especially, and I just, I, I'm saying this over again to you because I say it over again to myself, to love him with all of your mind. In other words, Lord, I'm not thinking about anything else but you. I don't have anything else on my mind but you. This time is your time. Now, of course, there's going to be intrusive thoughts and you're going to get distracted and all of those things. But what you've done is you've set aside time just to be with him. So under UTC schedule, I want you to write down Mark 12, 30. And typically, whenever I'm going through something with people, uh, we'll read the passage twice. I'll read it once, and then I'll have them read it once until they feel comfortable reading the Bible uh, and going first. And then they'll have them read it once, and then I'll read it once. Uh, but in this setting, what we'll typically probably do is just read them together. So let's read Mark 12, 30 together. Ready? Read. Hey, good job. I didn't even have to prompt you to read the address. Good job. All right. So the UTC schedule is most characterized by the word undistracted. Um, and the goal is to set aside 60 minutes of undistracted time um, with the Lord. Now, the reason why I encourage 60 minutes is because we only have one reference to time from the lips of Jesus about how long we should spend with him. And we find that passage in Matthew 26, 41. And this is when Jesus is in the garden, the most critical hour uh, of his life. He takes the apostles with him. Then he takes three and he says, hey guys, stay here and pray. I'm gonna go a little further into the garden and, and pray. Um, and he comes back and he finds them sleeping. And this is what he said. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. Listen, we, I think it's safe to say that the majority of, this, of the people in this room want to do the right thing. And we want to do it all the time. And the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus says that um, part of the solution to that, maybe not the only thing, but part of the solution, a major part of the solution, is to spend at least one hour with him. Now, I know, again, that it's sometimes impossible uh, to even dream about getting a solid one hour block with the Lord. And that's okay. That's why what I encourage people to do. Um, when and if necessary, uh, to break it up into different windows. So you can do one one-hour window, which I have on certain days. You could do two 30-minute windows. Uh, for example, 30 minutes before you leave for work, um, 30 minutes in the evening, or 30 minutes on your lunch break, and then another 30 minutes uh, in the evening. You could do four 15-minute windows. I actually start off with my day with what I call my first 15. 
So no matter what I do, um, unless my wife is out in the living room and I hear the baby's crying and I don't want to leave her by herself, that's not loving my neighbor as I love myself, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll stay in the room and get 15 minutes with the Lord. It's my first 15. Um, it's a good thing for my family when I spend time with Jesus before uh, they have to interact with me. Or um, I don't actually recommend that you go further than four 15 minutes and do something like five 12s. There's really not a tangible difference between 12 and 15 minutes. And I, what I think happens is when you do five windows, it feels burdensome. Because now it's like I've got to try to squeeze in another one and another one and another one. So I found that about four 15 minutes is about the most that you want to break up so that it becomes and feels more attainable for you. Uh, and you can always mix it up in any way that you uh, w- that your schedule best sees fit. So 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon during your lunch break, 30 minutes at night. 30 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon, 15 minutes before you get go to bed. This tool is not designed to put any type of burden on you, but to help you be intentional about getting in your time with the Lord. And so what you're going to do is you're going to draw out um, two columns and break it down into seven rows, as you see. You'll title day on the left and time on the right. On the left side, you're going to write down every day of the week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. People are like, an hour on Sunday too? But I was in church. I'll be honest, I used to think that. I'm like, I already did my hour. I did three hours. And if jail is preaching good, I did four. <laughs> Listen, I don't mind. That's why I'm at Garden City. Come on now. How many of you? (laughs) But let me tell you why you're going to appreciate having an hour on Sunday. Because it's going to give you time to go back and look at your notes. It's going to give you time to pray through the things that the Lord highlighted from the morning message. It's going to give you time to take that song that really touched your heart and sing it back to the Lord with just you and him. I like to try to get in 30 minutes very soon after church so I can digest and kind of go over my notes and then in the latter part of the evening um, kind of review and reflect. Now, notice that this is a UTC schedule, not a prayer schedule, which means a lot of things can go on um, within UTC. It could be prayer. It could be uh, reading your word. It could be reviewing notes. It could be sitting silently from the Lord, a mixture of all of those things. The ultimate goal is just that it would be undistracted and that it would, in total, come up to about one hour. That's kind of what you're ultimately aiming for. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you some time to draw this out and begin to fill this in and just do the best that you can. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes or so, about halfway through when there's five minutes left. We'll put a five minute timer up on the clock. Um, Jake is going to come up and give you some pretty instrumental music on the guitar uh, while you're working. Uh, But you may have to look into your phone calendar Uh, and say, well, what could I actually do on Thursday? What could I actually do on Friday? Every day will likely be be different for you. I encourage you when you're done, these these notebooks are designed for you to have. Sorry, Eden Center. I know I'm not on the screen anymore. Uh, I'm just stepping over to the side to get my notebook. Oh, Jason had a wide screen ready. He's always ready. So if I was sitting down with you, um, I would just show you my notebook. I I have it on the inside of my prayer calendar, my prayer, excuse me, my prayer journal, just right here. It's in pencil. This is a working, living, breathing document because it will probably change 
month to month, season to season, week to week, maybe even day to day, you're like, ah, I thought I could do that tomorrow, but I'm not going to be able to because I'm going to be flying, I'm going to be traveling, uh, but I'm going to readjust because my priority uh, is to get some time alone with the Lord because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so whatever you write down in your uh, notebook today, I encourage you to take it and put it somewhere where you're going to see it on a regular basis. I actually keep a disciple-making journal with me everywhere I go so that as I'm teaching people tools, I always have something. Um, Again, biblical, reproducible, uh, practical, and simple. The people you disciple, they don't need to have one of these beautiful binders and notebooks. You guys are just eating the fruit of being at Garden City um, and having an amazing creative team. But having a notebook is all you need. And it's all the people that you disciple will need is notebook and Bible. And that will allow you to be extremely effective. So just plan that whatever you write down to transfer it to something else. All right, so I'm going to give you about 10 minutes again. When there's five minutes left, um, you will see a five-minute countdown clock. Just going to pray for you as you begin. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we want to be with you. And sometimes it is hard. Sometimes it feels impossible, God. And Lord, I pray right now that there would be a lifting of any guilt, a lifting of any shame. And that people would see this as a fresh start. A clean slate, oh God. And that you would help them, that you would open their eyes, that you would lift the veil. What seems impossible, oh, it's impossible to get alone time with God. It's impossible um, to have time that's undistracted. Lord, would you help them? Would you show them? Like you showed Hagar, the oasis in the desert. Would you show them an oasis of prayer waiting for them? At the 6 o'clock hour, at the 12 o'clock hour, at the 4 o'clock hour, at the 10 o'clock hour, an oasis of refreshment waiting for them, that they might get it down, that they might write the vision, make it plain so they can see it and run. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone. All right, all right, all right. I'm so encouraged by what I saw as I was walking around the room. Jake, thank you again for blessing us. I have my friend Joe with me. Everybody say hi, Joe. Joe is going to share a testimony of just some of the fruit that he's seen from some of these tools. Yeah, so when uh, I'm part of the media team, if you didn't know, um, we ran through this a couple months ago uh, to kind of get a head start, but the fruit that I've seen from doing this uh, has really been just the little bit that I've been intentional about um, implementing this at work has been uh, just amazing. So I, I'm a truck driver, and I haul fuel, and that industry, a lot of, a lot of rough guys, a lot of uh, just don't want to hear about God, especially at work. So I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to implement this to some of these people that I work with, my, my coworkers? And um, I'm, a, I'm also a trainer at work, so I get to be with that person for like four to six weeks every single day. So I'm like, this is a perfect opportunity to just start sharing what I'm learning. <clears throat> so um, back in, when did we start doing that? Back in October, November? I had, a, I had a gentleman that was with me, and he was, he was kind of on the fence of whether or not uh, it was Jesus he was meditating to, and I was just kind of figuring out, like, what, what's, what's his position here? And I'd start sharing, sharing this stuff with him, and 
just being intentional about spending time with Jesus every single day. And literally, I just see, I just see the, the wheels turning in his head. He's like, oh, it's, it's Jesus. It's, that's that's kind of what I'm looking for. And <clears throat> the more and more time went on, the Holy Spirit would literally, as we'd be driving down the uh, road, the Holy Spirit would just come into the truck. And we'd both be crying. And it was just <laughs> amazing. And uh, what's really cool, too, is in our trucks, there's a, there's a dash cam that records us. So whoever's watching <laughs> is getting it, too. <clears throat> But the fruit that I've seen from, from him, so he's not with me any longer, um, and I have a new trainee, and I'm going through the same process with him as well, and same, very similar kind of fruit, but the, the guy before, um, every day I get into work, he works a, a couple hours before I do, and every day I open my locker, and in there is a page ripped out of his daily bread, the little, da- you know, the daily devotional. And he's, he puts it right in where I can see it. So just that little bit of fruit is just amazing from just sharing. So, yeah, so. That's awesome. I love uh, that song they sang this morning, Obedience. And the singer of that song, she has a line from another song. Um, says, simple obedience changes history. Simple obedience, it changes history. Um, and you might not think, oh, it'll change history on the grand scale. But I can tell you one thing, it'll change history for you, for your family, and for the lives of other people. So thank you for sharing, Joe. Joe's had some amazing testimonies on the way, along the way. And what I'm looking forward to is, uh, I'm looking forward to a lot of things, actually. But <laughs> there's two things that I'm really looking forward um, to in this context. Is one, for you guys to begin to have your own testimonies. Because um, I'm going to enjoy eating the fruit of that. But what I'm looking forward to more Um, a little more than that, is for you to begin to have testimonies from the people that you're discipling. That is part of the abundant life that Jesus promised. So I'm I'm really, really excited for you guys. So we're already getting ready to close. We're getting ready to wrap up. This is your uh, tool next week. We're going to go over the daily prayer calendar, which you've heard, you heard uh, Pam give a testimony about. You heard Sarah give a testimony about. Um, what I want to encourage you guys to do is to remember, um, and this is what I, I just tell people, um, you can't do this in your own strength. Uh, starting new habits of any kind are really challenging but especially if, when they have to do with pursuing Jesus. So one, give yourself a lot of grace. And two, and this is, I'm, I'm getting ready to give you a, a, some, a follow-up exercise, or uh, I don't like the word homework, uh, but for today we'll call it homework. Um, so I want you to do two things, okay? This is going to help you just be consistent and see fruit. is number one, I want you to share with someone who is not in this room or in the Eden Center, someone who's not going through the training. I want you to share with them that you've started doing this so that you can get some supportive accountability. Just say, hey, I started, I created a uh, UTC schedule uh, which is a, uh, just helps me to have undistracted time with Christ every day. Um, can I send you a, a picture of, my, of my, my schedule, my outline? And, and could you, if, if you have the bandwidth, could you just text me at these times? Or could you just ask me at the end of the day um, uh, how it's going? Um, and I encourage you uh, to let that person 
be someone different than your spouse because I think it just happens organically within your home. So getting someone outside of your home helps to add an additional layer. And then number two, I want you to teach this to someone else. Now, you can teach this to that person who you're asking to be accountable, but sometimes that doesn't always work. Um, But what I find is that it adds an additional layer of accountability to do something if you've taught it to someone else. Because you're like, oh, I just encouraged them to do it, so I better be doing it myself. And ultimately, isn't that what this is all about? Being disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And so when you teach this to someone else, here's what I encourage you to do. Just ask them, say, hey, I learned this tool that's really going to help me increase my time with God. Um, Would you like for me to show it to you? We've taken a lot of time to kind of set the stage and to, you know, let you know what's going to happen as we go along this journey. But taking somebody through this tool, it maybe takes 20 minutes. You say, I want to teach you a tool that will help you to increase your undistracted time with the Lord. It's called the UTC schedule. You show them a picture of yours. Say UTC stands for undistracted time with Christ. It's designed to help Give us a daily expression of the great commandment, especially the aspect of loving the Lord with all of our mind, which we see in Mark 12, 30. Let's write that down and let's read it together. You read it once, I'll read it. And then you say the the goal of our time is to spend at least one hour with him. And the reason why we aim for an hour is because that's the one time reference we have from Jesus. We find that in Matthew 26, 40 through 41. You don't have to memorize any of these passages because you'll have your little notebook with you. You say, let's read it together. And then you help, help them walk through and just p- plug in some times. And so after you teach it to them, say, okay, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell somebody that you're doing this. And I want you to teach it to someone else because it will help add layers of accountability. And so already you're responding to the call to make disciples. So we're going to close out with a couple things. The very last thing that we're going to do is I'm going to have you partner up And you're going to share with your partner what you believe is going to be one of the greatest hindrances from you actually implementing this. And then I want you to pray for one another. If you've never prayed for anyone and this is your first time actually doing that, uh, that's okay. That's what this is about. All you have to do is say, God, help them be consistent with this schedule. That's all you have to say. And the Lord can do great things with that simple prayer. So that's going to be the very last thing we're going to do. And that's how we're going to uh, dismiss. I'm going to just give you a little bit of a heads up of what's going to happen next week. Um, And then um, we're going to have Gerald just give us some final remarks. So next week and every time we gather for disciple making, the table host and table numbers will rotate. So next week, your table number and your table host will be in the Eden Center, and those of uh, you in the Eden Center will be in this room. Now, if you're not a table host, table is open seating. So first come, first serve. So if you want to, you can come back into the the sanctuary next week. Uh, But I would encourage you to make space. Uh, For your brothers and sisters who were in the Eden Center, even though it's an awesome setup there, I encourage you to go check it out before you leave. Um, But we're always going to rotate table numbers and table host so that everyone has the experience of being in both rooms. So it might help you to just kind of figure out, you know, who your table host is and get, you know, with your friends if you want to sit with them now 
so that you kind of already know where to go uh, next week. And then again, Eden Center people, you'll be here. Please, please, please remember to bring your binders with you next week. Um, this is kind of where you'll be able to keep all of your notes consolidated and so that as you're teaching people, uh, you can, this is kind of like a toolkit. Um, for me, this is kind of like uh, my disciple-making book. This is my toolkit. And I can pull out any tool that's necessary just by flipping to the page. And I don't need to have it all in here because I have it all in here. And so if you don't remember your binder next week, um, that's okay. Uh, don't take, please don't take a new one. Um, just get... <laughs> Uh, they're beautiful and not cheap and free. Um, so, so, but there will be blank sheets of paper for you to take notes, and then you can just put it into your uh, binder when you get home or transfer it into your disciple-making notebook if you so choose to uh, create one. Uh, care team, anything else I need to say? Jason, Alex, anything else I need to say? Guys, we are here, and God is already moving. So I am excited, I am encouraged, and let me just say I am proud of you guys. Joe. Well, go ahead and take uh, just a minute or two to pray with your partner. And then, uh, yeah, we'll come, we'll come together for one last blessing and be done for today. So get with your partner. What is the one thing that you think will hinder you the most from applying uh, the UTC schedule? Put language to it and lift each other up in prayer. Just take about 90 seconds to do that. Amen, amen. I hope you were encouraged uh, by the prayers lifted up uh, by your partner. And, you know, I also hope that you feel connected with some new people today, that you've met some new people and that you just feel the collective strength of what it looks like for us to go on this journey together as, as a family. As we continue to move forward, even on um, our worship celebration Sundays, talking about the priesthood, I hope you're really beginning to sense how serious Jesus is as it pertains to giving the Great Commission to a family and a priesthood. Amen? A family and a priesthood. Well, listen, as we close out today, um, I want you to celebrate uh, the fruit of this day. Uh, you only get to start one time, and I just want to say how amazing the start of this has been. And it, it truly is the, amen, it truly is the, the effort of so many people. Um, please let your table hosts know uh, how much you appreciate them. And just keep this team in prayer. Um, not only are we in a fast, but we're intentionally attempting to disciple 200 people. You know, there's spiritual warfare connected to obedience. Um, and we put some resources on the, the, the website for you that are fasting uh, to take communion at home by yourself and to understand how even when Jesus was fasting in Mark 4, it included spiritual warfare. And I don't say that for any other reason than to help us understand that Jesus, he trusts us with this. We're going to be victorious. We're going to be triumphant. We're going to see the fruit. We're going to see the breakthrough. We're going to see Jesus glorified. Amen. Let's pray. But we thank you uh, this morning, this afternoon, for what you have led us into. Your leadership is perfect, and we acknowledge you as our good shepherd, our great high priest. We thank you, Jesus, our King of kings and Lord of lords. We say it's all for you. It's all for you. Disciple-making was never intended to be complicated, but it is costly, and the cost is obedience. So, Holy Spirit, we ask as we go from this place, would you continue to pour out daily grace for fresh obedience to be lifted up to you, that we would see obedience as the expression of worship that you are truly worthy of. Holy Spirit, would you reveal the worth and beauty of Jesus in our hearts in such, in such a dynamic and fresh way in this season, that that would be what motivates us, the worth and the beauty of of Jesus. Even right now, Holy Spirit, would you increase our awareness of how worthy Jesus is and how beautiful Jesus is. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're worthy, Lord. You're so worthy of this. Your church making disciples, you're worthy of this, Jesus. You're worthy of this, Jesus. Moms and dads discipling their children, you're worthy of this, Jesus. Lord, your holy priesthood all throughout the community, all kinds of spheres of influence, making disciples, you're worthy of this, Jesus. Students, as young as elementary school, right now being trained with the same training that we're experiencing, taking it to their elementary school and making disciples, you're worthy of this. Middle school students making disciples, high school students, college students making disciples, you're worthy of this, Jesus. Business owners making disciples, you're worthy of this. Wherever you've called us, as followers, a family and a priesthood, you're worthy of us making disciples. May we see your worth and beauty in an increased way. Lord, I thank you for 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all with unveiled face are beholding the glory of the Lord, and we are being transformed from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Thank you for the undistracted time that we're going to experience with you, beholding your glory until we look like you. Beholding your glory until we become what we behold. You're worthy of this, Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Hallelujah. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom and peace. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.